Um, so this was a paper um, by Mullins and colleagues, and this was in a September 2022 issue of the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and the question that the ADVOR trial was asking was, does adding acetazolamide to loop diuretics lead to faster decongestion in heart failure? And what was compared in this study, patients were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to get either uh, IV acetazolamide or a placebo in addition to a standardized protocol of diuresis using loop diuretics. The top line finding in this study was that patients who were randomized to acetazolamide were 46% more likely to be euvolemic at day three. And this was an absolute difference of about 12% or a number needed to treat of eight. Can you talk a little bit about the congestion score and like how like clinically relevant that may or may not be? Yeah. So the primary outcome in this study was assessed by a congestion score. And this was a score from zero to 10 um, that was uh, kind of a composite of different physical exam findings. Um, this included edema, ascites, and pleural effusions. And the scores were assessed by cardiologists who were trained in this method. And a notable uh, omission is that um, weight was not a part of this and assessment of the jugular vein was not a part of the congestion score. So in terms of clinical relevance, you know, it doesn't incorporate some uh, pieces that I think we are used to using um, to track patients' volume status. But in terms of applicability, you know, there's a lot of variability in weight measurement. We know how difficult it can be to weigh patients who aren't able to stand. And we know that jugular vein assessment is also something that's kind of got a lot of variability to it. So the intent with using the components of the congestion score was that it was hoped that this would be something that was kind of reproducible uh, and, and subject to less uh, ascertainment bias. So they didn't include the SGLT2 sort of because of timing. Um, but when I look at this one coupled with like impulse um, or frankly all of the SGLT2 studies that have come out in the last couple of years, like how do you actually in practice apply the acetazolamide and um, the SGLT2? Yeah. Th this is a really important question, Meredith. And all the cardiologists I've spoken to about this have been a little underwhelmed. Um, and they've basically said that, you know, every study of is better diuresis better has shown that better diuresis is better. <laughs> so that's not really going to surprise anybody. Um, I do think the big, um, uh, the big unknown that remains to be seen with the applicability of, of this trial is whether or not this same effect size is going to be seen in patients who are already getting, you know, action at that part of the nephron. Because Impulse really suggested that it's, it's probably some type of diuretic augmentation that's responsible for that symptom benefit. So, you know, in the modern era where all patients with heart failure are going to be on SGLT2s, whether this effect size that we saw in a naive population from acetazolamide is going to translate, that that remains to be seen. And I guess just like out of curiosity, has it like changed your practice? Like, are you gunk on the acetazolamide and then starting the SGLT2 later. Can I tell you, I have been looking for the opportunity to try this and it has not presented itself yet, chiefly because everyone has been on SGLT2s. What this study did um, persuade me of at least is that augmentation of diuresis in patients who are not diuretic resistant is probably safe. Okay. And that is a question that comes up all the time. You know, whether patients um, whose output is slowing down, you know, should we start metolazone or chlorthalidone in these patients? This study, um, in my view, gave me um, some evidence to kind of make me feel like that strategy is, is going to be safe. 